the Muslim conquest. So okay. Christianity evolves and just life. Okay. So um, we're streaming live at this point, but I'm still going to wait for, it's only 8.32. I'm going to wait for a few more minutes to see if okay. there are any people who are um, coming in. And uh, hi, Carol. Oh, wow. Are you in, still in Israel? Hi, no, I came back on Friday, but I listened to I was about to, to say, wow, that's really dedication. <laughs> no, yeah, the, no, I didn't live him live last week, but I listened today. I listened to the recording. It was excellent. Okay, well, we're going to pick up from there. So uh, I'm going to start and I'm going to just give it another two or three minutes. Hello, so, everybody. Yeah. Hey, Khani. Hi, Khani. He's fine and he's coming. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome from Florida. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi Diane, Mazel tov. Thank you, thank you. Okay, let me go away. I'll go away, here we go. Is Lonnie back? I'm gonna start at 835. So. Rabbi Klinger, Mazel Tov to you too. How's the baby? He's doing great. He's doing great. He's getting big already. God. <laughs> yeah. Your timeline was amazing, by the way. Oh, I'm glad you found it uh, helpful. Yeah. Sorry, having the timeline I find very useful. It puts, you have names, dates, things, but when you see them constructed on a timeline, it, uh, particularly if it's annotated, it, it helps it all make sense and bring it into focus. So, uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to begin. Uh, this evening is the second of two programs during between Shvasav, Tammuz, and Tishabav, that will explore the often ignored history of Jewish life in Eretz Israel after the destruction. Last week, I was able to rely in part upon an invaluable resource, the detailed uh, history of Israel that Joseph has set forth in his writings from the Hashmonaim period to the end of the revolt. This week, we must deal with the utter lack of any contemporaneous histories for the next 500 years. We don't know many of the most basic facts for which we can only make educated guesses. So the task of contemporary historians is to glean from Jewish, Roman, and Christian written sources and from archeological bits and pieces, sufficient facts to try and cobble together a coherent narrative. Last week, we discussed Israel on the eve of destruction, the revolt, the temple's destruction, and the resurrection of the Jewish people in Yavne under the leadership of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. Chronologically, what follows is the Bar Kokhba rebellion. But before we look at that, I thought it was important to discuss the centrality of the Beit Mikdash to Jewish thought and belief after its destruction. I noted last week the deeply held belief that the temple was the actual dwelling place of the Shekhina. The destruction of the temple therefore was viewed as evidence that Hashem had abandoned his people, a view that was seized upon by Christian writers. The presence of the temple represented Hashem's presence. 
hence the imperative for rebuilding the temple. When we recite three times a day the prayer for the rebuilding of the temple, that prayer is for most of us wistful or wishful. It will be rebuilt when the Mashiach comes. But for almost 600 years from the Chorban until the Muslim conquest in the seventh century, the Jewish people had an ever present belief that the Beit HaMikdash would be rebuilt, not in some mystical future time by the Mashiach, but today, and if not today, then tomorrow. This belief was palpable and ever present for 600 years, and it was the core belief that fueled the severe rebellion, the several rebellions against Rome and the three aborted efforts at the temple's reconstruction. Evidence of the centrality of the temple can be seen even from the way time was counted, as we see from a headstone of a Jew buried in Zoar in the fifth century that noted he had died in the 386th year after the destruction of the temple. The reality of reconstruction, or perhaps more properly, the prospect of reconstruction was not a pipe dream. It only needed the proper confluence of historical forces and personalities to make it happen. And each aborted effort at reconstruction only served to reinforce the hopes of the Jewish people that the next time it would succeed. There were three attempts during the 600 years that we are examining to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash. Tosfot and Bereshit Rabbah claims that Emperor Hadrian, at the beginning of his reign, had issued an imperial de decree ordering the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple, and that preliminary site work had been started. Unfortunately, there are no contemporaneous chroniclers, Jewish or otherwise, reporting on the reign of Hadrian in Israel. As such, we have no insight as to what Hadrian did or didn't do during his reign with respect to Judea. To the extent that work may have been started on rebuilding the temple, it was certainly not completed. Hadrian, for reasons unknown, abandoned his conciliatory attitude towards the Jews, and in the year 129 or 130, issued a series of anti-Semitic edicts, including the changing the name of Jerusalem to Elia Capitolina, Elia being Hadrian's family name. Barring Jews from living there, and instead of restoring the temple, directing that a temple to Jupiter be built and a statue be erected of himself on Harabayat. That year, he issued coins to commemorate the founding of Elia Capitolina. Hadrian's decision was certainly a major factor leading to the Bar Kokhba rebellion, and it was the mission to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash that helped fuel the rebellion, a mission memorialized on the coins issued by Bar Kokhba during the rebellion. However, there is no evidence of any attempt by Bar Kokhba to actually begin construction. Ultimately, Rome crushed the rebellion and with it any efforts at that time to rebuild the temple. In fact, the Romans did ultimately erect a statue to Hadrian and build a temple to Jupiter on the site. No remains of this temple have been found, although a section from the base of Hadrian's statue with his name on it remains. It was given secondary usage as part of the Arab and Crusader rules. You can see that if you, on the southern wall, you can see the, uh, this um, section of this, the base, which is actually up, instead of being horizontal, is vertical. And it was, it was used uh, by the gate, by the Crusader gates. The second attempt at restoring the temple came about during the short life rule of Emperor Julian the Apostate. In 361 Julian, the last of the Constantinian dynasty of emperors, succeeded to the throne. Julian was given the sobriquet to the apostate because of his antipathy to Christianity and his desire to restore the worship of pagan gods, <clears throat> as well as to support the ancient religion such as Judaism that had traditionally been recognized. In 363, Julian ordered the temple to be rebuilt in an effort to counter the influence of Christianity in the empire. Noteworthy <clears throat> is that this was a Roman initiative. However, it did gain a qualified of wary support from the Jews with notable opposition from Reb Chilkia. After clearing the Temple Mount and laying a foundation for the temple's reconstruction, a severe earthquake struck destroying the work that had been done. Soon thereafter, Julian was killed in battle uh, against the Persians and his successors re-embraced Christianity and put an end to any thought of a new temple. During the Byzantine period of rule in Palestine, the church wanted the Temple Mount to remain as a room, evidence of the fall of Judaism from God's grace. The Temple Mount also served as a source of building material 
for the many Christian churches built in Jerusalem. It had long been a mystery as to what happened to the mammoth columns described by Josephus that supported the roof of the basilica built on the southern end of the Temple Plaza. After the Six Day War, when excavations were done in the Jewish quarter, the ruins of the Byzantine Nea Church, which was actually the main church in Jerusalem, uh, were discovered. And among those ruins, some of the columns were found. The Byzantines continued borrowing Jews from living or even entering Yerushalayim, <clears throat> only allowing them once a year on Tisha B'Av to visit and mourn its destruction. The constant wars between Rome and the Persian Empire that had continued for centuries culminated in 610 with a victory by the Persians driving the Romans out of Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. The Jewish community in Israel had actively supported the Persians against Roman forces. Initially, in gratitude for their support, the Persians allowed the Jews control of Jerusalem and efforts were started to rebuild the temple. And it is reported that sacrifices were restored to the Temple Mount. These efforts, however, were short-lived as the Persians were soon thereafter defeated by the Byzantines who regained control of Palestine. The partly rebuilt structure was torn down and the Temple Mount was restored to its, returned to its prior state as a ruin. It is only with the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem in the seventh century and the construction in subsequent years of the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque that Jewish dreams of rebuilding the temple were abandoned and abdicated to the Mashiach. As a prelude to discussing the Bar Kokhba rebellion, we cannot ignore one of the most profound series of events that ever affected the Jewish people, what is known to history as the Kitos Rebellion, or to Jewish historians as Merit Hatzutzot, the Diaspora Revolt. This topic merits a separate lecture, but since it largely affected the Diaspora and not Eretz Yisrael, we will limit our observations to a bare outline. In the period 115 to 117, beginning towards the end of the reign of Emperor Trajan, revolts arose first in Cyrenica, an area encompassing modern day Libya, then spreading to Egypt, Cyprus, and lastly to Mesopotamia. The cause of these revolts in Cyrenica, Egypt, and Cyprus is not known. In Mesopotamia, the Jewish rebellion was part of the broader regional rebellion against Roman rule. While the causation of these revolts is not known, the damage and catastrophic casualties that resulted was reported in various sources. These rebellions were extremely violent and resulted in widespread slaughter by Jewish rebels and Gentiles, and a resultant massacre of Jews. The Talmud Yerushalmi in Masech Sukkah speaks of the massacre of the Jews of Egypt and the rivers of Jewish blood that flowed into the ocean as far as Cyprus. The Greek historian Appian of Alexandria reported that Emperor Trajan was exterminating the Jewish nation in Egypt. The rebellion did reach Eretz Israel, but it would appear that it was not widespread and seemed to have been centered and perhaps limited to the area around Lud. The Talmud in Masechet Ta'anit, in Masechet Megillah, and in Masechet Rosh Hashanah refers only to the executed leaders of the rebellion as the martyrs of Lud. But the number of Jewish rebels in Israel appears to have been very small, hence the name Merit HaTzutzov. The Kitos rebellion did not appear to have made any material impact on the Jewish community living in Israel, neither demographically nor with respect to return of political autonomy that was beginning to be reinstated at that time, but it did leave an indelible impression on the memory of how the Romans treated Jews in the diaspora. The Bar Kokhba rebellion is widely understood to have begun in the year 132, but this date is still subject of different thought among historians. This rebellion may be seen as the culmination of the religious and political tensions in Judea following the failed first revolt. These tensions escalated with the establishment of a large Roman permanent military presence in Judea, the 10th Legion, with a weakened economy and with a harsh suppression of the Jewish diaspora during the Kitos Wars. Anti-Jewish edicts may have contributed to the start of the rebellion, but there is serious question among historians as to the timing of these edicts and it is more likely that they were issued as a response to the rebellion rather than as a precursor. Off-cited as a contributing factor to the rebellion was a ban on circumcision that was issued around the year 129. In fact, 
the actual ban was a lex cornelia against castration that parenthetically included circumcision. This ban on circumcision was not expressly directed to the empire's Jewish subjects, but obviously seriously impacted on Jewish life. It would appear among the proximate causes of the rebellion were growing messianic beliefs and Hadrian's construction of a new city over the ruins of Jerusalem. Of interest is that the Mishnah at Masachet Tani lists the plowing of Jerusalem in preparation for the building of Elia Capital Lina as taking place after the fall of Betar in 135, suggesting that Hadrian's edicts regarding Jerusalem were punishment for the rebellion. However, the, chron the chronology offered by the Mishnah is contradicted by the fact that there were Roman coins honoring the founding of Elia Capitolina already in circulation by the year 132, the year when the revolt started. One of the main inspirations of the rebels led by Shimon Bar Kokhba was the hope of rebuilding the Beit HaMikdash. In fact, an image of the Beit HaMikdash appeared on the coinage minted by the rebels. Significant in the spread of the rebellion was the support given by Rabbi Akiva, perhaps the most revered of the Tanaim of this generation. Tens of thousands of Jews joined Bar Kokhba's forces after the revolt started and after Bar Kokhba's success in defeating Roman garrisons in Jerusalem and central Judea. Despite the arrival of significant Roman reinforcements from Syria, Egypt, and Arabia, initial rebel victories over the Romans established an independent state over most parts of Judea for over two years, and Bar Kokhba took the title of Nasi. As well as leading the revolt, Bar Kokhba was regarded by many Jews as the Mashiach who would restore their national independence. The Roman military setback, however, caused Emperor Hadrian to assemble a very large Roman force from across the empire, which invaded Judea in 134 under the command of General Sextus Julius Severus. The Roman army was made up of six full legions and elements from up to six additional legions from afar, as far away as Britain and Germany. It is estimated that one third of Rome's entire military took part in the campaign against Marco. Three times the Roman forces that were used to quash the revolt in the year 70. After extended and fanatical resistance on the part of the Jewish rebels, particularly the two-year siege of Betar, the fall of which is traditionally dated to be on Tisha B'Av 135, the rebellion was effectively crushed. Details of the rebellion are mostly unknown, with the only Roman account being that of Dio Cassius writing 100 years later. His reporting on the rebellion merely lists the results of the war, does not mention Bar Kokhba's name, nor uh, does he recount any of the battles. A Christian historian, Eusebius of Caesarea, writing about 150 years after the rebellion, does provide some limited details on the war and its aftermath. The Talmud Yerushalmi describes the results of the rebellion, particularly the Romans execution of Jewish leaders and the ensuing religious persecution. However, it does not attempt to provide any details of the fighting or organization of the rebel forces. Given the enormity of the rebellion, it is amazing that basic questions remain unanswered. The principal theater of conflict was central Judea, but did the conflict extend to the Galil or the Golan? Did the Samaritans participate in the rebellion? Some historians question as to whether Bar Kokhba actually occupied Jerusalem, although the consensus is that he did. Incredibly, while we don't have a handle on basic critical facts, and there is a paucity of written documentation on the rebellion, Primary sources, including letters actually written by Bar Kokhba to his followers, have been found. The Bar Kokhba revolt resulted in major demographic changes in Israel, particularly the wide scale population reduction of central Judea, much more so than following the first revolt. According to Dio Cassius, 580,000 Jews perished in the war, and many more died of hunger and disease. He also notes that thousands of Judean war captives were sold into slavery. The Talmud in Masechet Ta'anit and in Masechet Gitim discuss the scope of death and destruction and speak of 800,000 Jewish casualties. <clears throat> it is likely that the reported death, deaths by both Dio Cassius and the Talmud are grossly exaggerated, but whatever the actual numbers were, they were staggering. As a result of the rebellion, Judy, Judea ceased being the heartland of Israel, and the center of Jewish life shifted to the Galil and the Golan, 
where it would remain so for the next 500 years. Following the fall of Beta, the Romans carried out acts of retribution against the Jews remaining in central Judea, most infamously the murder of the 10 martyrs, including Rabbi Akiva set forth in the Talmud and that we recount on Yom Kippur. Roman casualties were also very, very heavy, so much so that the 23rd Legion was permanently disbanded as a result of the serious losses it suffered and the shame that those losses brought to Rome. Some historians argue that the 9th Legion was also permanently disbanded as a result of the losses suffered in this war. In an attempt to erase any memory of Judea or ancient Israel, Hadrian wiped the name of Judea off the map and changed the name of the province to Syria, Palestina, and hence the source for the use of the name Palestine. Immediately after the rebellion, Emperor Hadrian issued a series of edicts known to us as Gseot Adrianus, designed to crush the national spirit and fabric of the Jews of Israel. Thus, Jewish courts were closed and the appointment of sages or judges was punishable by death. Synagogues were closed and the public study of Torah was prohibited on pain of death. Observance of Jewish festivals, as well as the mitzvot of Tefillin, Zuzah, and Tevilah were banned. Following the death of Hadrian in 138, there was an easing of the act of persecution of the Jews, but as anti-Jewish Gezerot remained in effect for an unspecified number of years until finally abolished during the reign of the successor Emperor Antonius Pius, who also issued an edict that expressly permitted Jews to circumcise their children, but not to circumcise converts or slaves. The disability that remained was that Jewish people had again been stripped of the status of an ethnos and that they, had in, that they had enjoyed before the rebellion. And as a subject people, they were not entitled to any communal rights or institutions. The slow emergence of the office of the Nasi and of the Sanhedrin and Usha in the years following the rebellion were the result of their efforts of Reb Shimon ben Gamliel II, institutions that the Roman administration at that time tolerated but did not officially recognize. In examining this period, we must keep in mind that the anti-Jewish edicts, while directed to the entire Jewish community, were for the most part enforced against prominent persons who openly defied the edicts, such as Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Hananya ben Tradion, who publicly gathered students for the study of Torah. In those communities where opposition to the edicts was not flaunted, it was possible for a semblance of normalcy to return to Jewish life, and later for the return of the Nasi and Sanhedrin, as the governing institutions of the community. Despite the tragic consequences of the rebellion and the large loss of life, the Jewish population nonetheless remained in the majority and slowly began to thrive in the Galil, in the Golan, in the Beit Sha'an Valley, in the Jordan Valley, and even in parts of Judea and in the Negev. Looking at the Jewish communal institutions that were created in Yavna, the Talmud indicates that the Romans allowed Rabbi Yochanan to establish an academy there. However, Rabbi Yochanan also set up a Beit Din. Over the next 100 years, the communal leadership evolved into two institutions, the Patriarchate, a word which we typically don't think of as being Jewish, and the Sanhedrin. When Rabban Gamliel assumed in the year 85 the position as Nasi, following Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he became the de facto leader of the Jewish community a position later to be recognized by the Romans as the Patriarchate. But what was the Patriarchate? Was it a separate entity equal to the Sanhedrin or was the Patriarch merely the chairman of the Sanhedrin? Could the Patriarch overrule the Sanhedrin? The Mishnah and Tosfot show that the Patriarch emerged as a kind of royalty, a direct linear descendant of Hillel. The Patriarch was initially perceived as head of the academy as well as head of the Beit Din and the Sanhedrin. By the end of the third century, the Patriarchate and Sanhedrin evolved into two distinct political institutions with distinct leadership. The Patriarch resided in Sipori and the Sanhedrin sat in Tiberias under the leadership of Rabbi Yochanan bar Nafka, although the Patriarch ultimately also relocated to Tiberias. Returning to Yavne. The death of Rabban Gamliel was followed by a hiatus of about 30 years in the dynasty of Nisi'im descended from Hillel. Why Gamliel was not immediately followed by his son Gamliel II is not known. 
Perhaps he was too young at that point. It is not known who succeeded Rabbi Gamliel. Some scholars suggest Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hanania, followed by Rabbi Akiva. Others suggest Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria. Professor Yigal alone does not opine as to who might have served as Nasi, but states positively that Rabbi Tafan served as Avbeidin, the presiding officer of the Sanhedrin during this period, citing both the Talmud Yerushalmi and Babli in support of his conclusion. Following the Bar Kokhba rebellion, the surviving Jewish community turned for leadership to Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel II. In about 142, the Sanhedrin was reconstituted by him in Usha and the Galil. Rabban Gamliel exercised firm control over the Sanhedrin. However, his control was tempered by his willingness to share authority with other saviors, thereby restoring the power and dignity of the office of Nasi and of the Sanhedrin. Rabban Gamliel also worked to strengthen ties with the diaspora, resulting in a steady flow of scholars from Babel to learn in Israel. I was somewhat surprised that throughout this 600 year period, I mean, we tend to understand that until the modern times, most people were born and died within 20 miles of, of where they were born. And uh, we didn't have this kind of movement of people, but Throughout the 600 year period, there was a constant flow back and forth of Rabbeim between um, Israel and Babel. Um, under his leadership, uh, the Sanhedrin had the final word of halakha in Israel and in the diaspora. Dayanim in the diaspora were, were re appointed by the Nasi. The Nasi could appoint and dismiss leaders of diaspora communities. An example being of the Nasi's appointment of a successor to Rav to the Academy of Pumbedita. Importantly, the diaspora paid a tax to help support the patriarchate in Israel. Relations between the Roman administration and the Nasi dramatically improved under the leadership of Yehuda Halevi, and good relations continued under the leadership of his son, Rabban Gamliel III, and his grandson, Rabban Yehuda Hanasiah. During the reign of the five Severan emperors in the third century, the Nasi of the Sanhedrin was recognized by the Romans as patriarch, and as the de jure leader of the Jewish community in Israel, and also as an official of the Roman administration. The rule of the seven emperors from 193 to 235 is considered the high watermark of Jewish Roman relations. Yehuda Hanasi had a combination of intelligence, spiritual greatness, and strong political leadership. As Nasi, he did not seek to compose his view and modestly took the position that he was an equal among equals in the Sanhedrin. This modesty and strength of character enabled him to get many gifted scholars to work together to compile the Mishnah. Yehuda Hanasi was able to unite the community into one organic whole under the political, social, and religious leadership of the Patriarchate and Sanhedrin, a dual structure that was to endure for 200 years until the formal abolishment of the Patriarchate by Emperor Theodosius II in the year 429. The last patriarch was Rabban Gamliel VI, who died in 425. Turning to the Sanhedrin, the great Sanhedrin in Yerushalayim was abolished by Vespasian following the revolt. The Beit Din established by Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai in Yavna ultimately evolved into a reconstituted Sanhedrin. Unlike the original Sanhedrin, which only sat in Jerusalem in its appointed quarters on the Temple Mount, the Beit Din set up by Rabbi Yochanan had no fixed seat. Thus, at times, it convened in Yavna, but also in Lud. Why Lud? Because Rabbi Tarfon, in the time of Emperor Hadrian, presided over the Beit Din and lived in Lud. Rabbi Gamliel's the second's decision to reconvene the Sanhedrin in Usha and the Galil mirrored the recentering of Jewish life away from central Judea. Gamliel later moved the Sanhedrin to Beit Sharim. In later years, the Sanhedrin sat in Sipori, where the Mishnah was redacted under the leadership of Yehuda Nasi, and ultimately in Tiberias under the leadership of the Avbeit Din, Yochanan Bar Nafka, where the Talmud Yerushalmi over the next 100 years was compiled. The Sanhedrin in its final years, perhaps in an effort to avoid Byzantine persecution, was referred to as the Va'ad or as the Beit HaMidrash. The Sanhedrin had twofold purpose. It was both a court and an academy. It functioned as a high court only when questions of great import were raised, at which point members of the Beit team were called to participate. 
there was no requirement for all members to attend. And usually there was not a full quorum, except when very major issues were involved. The Sanhedrin's second purpose was that it served as the highest academy for the study of Torah. It seems from the sources that the academy in its early years was presided over by the Nasi, who when present chose the topic in open discussion, followed by discussion among the sages, those who had smicha and mochave rim. The sessions were open to the public and both Talmudim of the sages, as well as the general public were able to attend. Every sage had the right to deliver a drasha on the subject matter. The academy functioned without inter interruption, whether or not the Nasi was present. And many of the famous sages of Yavna also had their own academies and law courts in their home communities. Who was a sage? A Talmud was, who was given smicha by either the patriarch and or the Sanhedrin. This enabled him to give halachic opinions in his own local Beit Din and to adjudicate legal dispo, disputes in his home community, as well as to sit as a Kaver of the Sanhedrin. The sages conducted in their communities regular programs of adult education targeted at the average man, including both halacha and agada. In contrast to what became the tradition for rabbis in Eastern Europe to only give a drush twice a year, the sages in Israel would speak each Shabbat using this opportunity to convey their reflections on religious, national, moral, and social matters, sort of what we have today. The sages would denounce social evils and encourage their communities to stand fast in the face of persecution and to love Hashem, the Torah, and the Jewish people. The Jewish leadership after the destruction produced the most central elements of Jewish civilization, prayer and the codification of the halakha. The Mishnah was largely compiled during the second century and was transmitted orally until redacted under the leadership of Yehudal Anasi. The year of redaction is traditionally given as 200. The Mishnah was written in Hebrew and sets forth rabbinic discourse on Jewish law. It addressed the task of fashioning a way of life capable of surviving in a world without the Beit HaMikdash and in a world with no ready prospect of liberation from Roman rule. Almost as soon as the Mishnah was completed, the sages in Israel began to debate the meaning and effect of the halakha, as set forth in the Mishnah. Of interest is that this debate, which ultimately evolved in the Talmud Yerushalmi, was mostly in Aramaic and not the Hebrew or the Mishnah. The year of completion of the Yerushalmi is subject of different opinions that extend from as early as the year 350 to as late as 429, the year the Patriarchate was abolished by Emperor Theodosius II. Prayers that we consider central to all liturgy were developed prior to the Churban, including the Amidah, the Shema, Bikat Amazon, Kiddush, and Habdalah. However, prayers while the temple was still standing were essentially personal, although we learned from the Mishnah and Masech Hamid that the Shema and the Aseret Hadibot were read in the Beit HaMikdash as part of the temple service. Public and personal prayers evolved in the years following the Chorban. Rabbinic sources attribute to Rabban Gamliel and his assembly, one, the format of prayers, two, the duty of individuals to pray, and three, the requirement to pray three times a day. The Talmud Bavli notes in Masechet Brachot and in Masechet Megillah that Shimon HaPakuli set forth the 18 benedictions in their proper order in the presence of Rabban Gamliel at Yavne. However, the Talmud in Masechet Megillah also says at the time of <clears throat> Rabbi Yochanan, 120 elders, among whom were many prophets, drew up the 18 benedictions in a set order. Professor Alon, in an effort to reconcile these two traditions, observes that there is evidence that the first three brachot of the Shemona Esrei, as well as the last three, were in use at the time of the Beit HaMikdash, as seen in the Machloka between Beit Shemai and Beit Hillel. There is also evidence that the 12 petitionary prayers also predate the, predate the destruction of the references to building, <clears throat> with the references to building the temple relating back to the Bayer Bishon. Professor Alon therefore draws the conclusion that Rabban Gamliel was responsible only for the final editing of the Shemona Esrei. Although the Mishnah Masechet Brachot references the daily Shabbat and festival prayers, as well as the Hallel, it does not set forth details and text. It is not until the 9th and 10th centuries that Amram Gaon and Sajah Gaon 
compile CDREAM to standardize the text and services. The Mishnah notes in Masechet Brachot that Rabban Gamliel said, every day one should pray the 18th, but there is evidence that this custom already existed. Professor Alon concludes that Rabban Gamliel in making prayer mandatory took an existing practice and gave it the status of religious law. It is also in this period that the Passover Haggadah is defined as set forth in Masachet Pesachim. The Haggadah, in essence, transferred Pesach to a festival that could be celebrated independent of the temple with the Seder replacing the Korban Pesach that can no longer be brought. It is widely held that the canon of Jewish scripture, the Tanakh, was closed during the time of Rabban Gamliel's administration in Yavne, along in various references in the Mishnah. The need to close the canon gained urgency during this period, given the proliferation of apocrypha from both Jewish and Judeo-Christian sources, so as to avoid confusion as to what should be accepted as halakha. Lahabdil. We now come to the Mel Gibson question. What language was spoken in Israel during the life of Jesus? Prior to the Bar Kokhba rebellion, it would appear that Hebrew was the primary language spoken in Judea, with Aramaic secondary and with Greek being spoken by the elite for those having to deal with the Roman administration. However, in the Galil, Aramaic was the primary language with Hebrew secondary. Through the writing of the Mishnah, Hebrew was the primary language for religious writings, but that was later eclipsed by Aramaic, which was used in the discourse and writing of the Talmud Yerushalmi. Of note is that Yehuda Hanasi had a disdain for the use of Aramaic and encouraged all to speak only Hebrew. Given that the sages held that prayers could be said in any language, Rabbi Yehuda's preference, if not insistence on Hebrew, should be seen as nationalistic and not religious. With respect to Israel's population during this period, it is nearly impossible to arrive at scientific numbers. No census was ever taken after the revolt and historians use different methodologies to try and make estimates, such as counting Jewish settlements, counting synagogues, estimating agricultural yields to gauge how large a population could be support, supported. But none of these methods seem to be meaningful or to provide clear answers, nor is there any consensus among historians as to which methodology to use or as to the numbers of Jews living in Israel at any one time. It does appear, however, to be a consensus among historians that Jews represented the majority of the population in the Galil and Golan through the fourth century. Evidence of the Jewish majority in the fourth century may also be seen from the fact that there were no bishops attending or appointed for the Galil at the Council of Nicaea in 325. However, after Christianity became the state religion, much of the pagan population of Eretz Israel converted. And in addition, there was a surge of Christian pilgrims, some of whom stayed and settled. Most historians accept that during the last two centuries of Roman rule, the Jews, while no longer the majority, still remained the plurality, along with Christians and Samaritan minorities until the Muslim conquest in the seventh century. Prior to the revolt, most Jews were farmers and wealth was associated with land ownership. In Mishnah Masechet Shabbat, Rabbi Tarfon answers the question, who is rich as follows. He who owns 100 vineyards, 100 fields, and has 100 slaves to work them. That's pretty rich. Uh, but as noted in our earlier lecture, after the revolt, the Spatian seized most of the land in Judea as state land, and former landowners became tenant farmers. Notwithstanding the fact that the evidence suggests that in the Galil and Golan, the land was largely held by small independent farmers and not by large Roman or Jewish landowners. The image of the typical Jew during the period after the revolt as reflected in the Mishnah is that of a farmer with a small plot of land sufficient to support his immediate family. However, there are also large estates owned by Jews, including some of the Amaraim um, and Tanaim, who had sufficient capital to buy a property that was confiscated, that was had been confiscated by the Romans. The Talmud Yerushalmi raises the question, is most of the land of Israel in Jewish hands or in Gentile hands? However, Professor Alon notes that most of the sources bear out the conclusion that no overwhelming decrease in Jewish land ownership in Palestine took place until the Muslim conquest in 636. 
I have not been able to find any consensus among historians as to the overall economy during the long period of our discussion. There are different opinions as to each century, nor does there appear to be a consensus as to whether there was any correlation between the overall economy of the empire and that of Palestine at any one point of time. As noted earlier, the economy of Israel was agrarian. The region was marked by highly developed methods of cultivation, particularly the wide scale use of irrigation. The principal agricultural products were cereal grains, fruits, olive oil, wine, and dates. The production of cereals seems to have been sufficient for all domestic needs, including a surplus in some years available for export. Olive oil was at that time particular, primarily produced in the Galil and was exported particularly to the diaspora seeking oil from Israel. Wine had traditionally been an important holy land crop and was exported throughout the empire. Dates were cultivated in Gaza, around Jericho, Zoar being dubbed the date city in the Mishnah, as well as in the Beit Sha'an Valley. The fishing industry was centered on the Kinara, but was also to be found in Akko and on the Jordan River. The fish was salted and dried for export. Animal husbandry, not surprisingly, was to be found throughout the region with the raising of sheep, goats, cattle, and poultry. The manufacture of clothing was an important segment of the economy although principally for domestic use. However, linen fabric and garments were manufactured and exported. The important center for this trade was Beit Sha'an. Utensils and glassware were also manufactured, Tiberias being known for its fine glassware and pottery. In answer to the question as to whether the Jewish community was literate in this period, there is evidence that following the Bar Kokhba rebellion, there were permanent institutions in the towns and villages for elementary religious education primarily limited to teaching boys to read from the Torah, but it seemed that writing was not necessarily included in the curriculum. For those children of exceptional talent or of means, they would study halacha with the master. Girls were not part of the educational system, period. After the destruction, the synagogue emerged as the focal point of Jewish communal life and prayer replaced the korbanot that had been offered in the temple. Of interest is that in the fourth century, under pressure from the church, anti-Jewish Roman laws were enacted that amongst other things prohibited the building of new synagogues, even though there were existing laws dating back to Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, which protected the rights of Jews to build and maintain synagogues. Notwithstanding the edict and notwithstanding claims that the Jewish population was in decline, both in numbers and economically, the period covering the fourth through the seventh centuries is seen as the golden age of synagogue building in Eretz Israel, and not just in the Galil and Golan, but in Gaza, Ashkelon, Jericho, and other sites in central and southern Israel. As previously noted, relations with the Greek Gentile population in Israel was always problematical. <clears throat> the birth of the Christian religion in the first century presented its own problems, both within Christian dogma and with respect to the Jewish community in Israel. Nascent Christianity was a Jewish sect. Its members were exclusively Jewish who observed the mitzvot. However, they were distinguished from the Jewish community only in that they recognized Jesus as the Messiah sent to redeem the Jewish people, although not recognizing him at that point as a deity. The Christian Bible in Acts notes that apostles like Peter and John went to the temple every day to worship the God of Israel. Initially, Christianity confined its preaching to the Jewish community as noted in the book of Matthew, Jesus told his followers, go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christianity changed its course with Saul of Tarsus, later called Paul, who was not an apostle and had never even met Jesus. Paul recognized Jesus as Messiah, not as the son of David sent to redeem the Jewish people, but rather as the son of God who died on the cross to save all of mankind. Paul began preaching to and converting Gentiles. Suffice it to say that Christianity, as it evolved, feared sharply from its nascent beliefs and itself split into various sects. Rabbinic sources, for the most part, were not particularly interested in early Christianity per se, but the emergence of various sects within Judaism, especially the Judeo-Christian sects, was an impetus to impose an orthodoxy that followed Norman of Rabbinic Judaism. In this atmosphere, we have the 12th paragraph of the Shemona Esrei referred to in Talmudic literature, 
in, in English, uh, a little top note, in uh, the art scroll Sidur as Birkat Haminim. The Talmud Bavli in Masechet Brachot discusses this bracha, but comes down to us in the Ashkenazi Sidur is a Baudelaireized version of the original prayer of Elamal Shnim that does not even mention Minim. Rather, it is limited to uh, and for slanderers. The Sephardic prayer book, however, reads La Minim Vilamal Shnim for the heretics and for the slanderers and includes other words of reprobation for your enemies and those who hate you and to the wicked government, absent from the Mani Ashkenazi Sidur. The Cairo Geniza has revealed an, the ancient provisions of this prayer that was prevalent in Eretz Yisrael during the late Roman period, which pulls no punches and reads, may the apostates have no hope and mayest thou uproot the wicked government speedily in our day. May the Nazarenes and the Minim disappear in a moment. Let them be erased from the book of life and not be inscribed with the righteous. What then was the purpose for the Rabbeim and Yavne to write the Birkat Minim? In essence, it was to brand Judeo Christians as apostates, to bar them from the synagogue, and to state in unequivocal terms that Judeo Christians could no longer be considered part of the Jewish people. During the first 300 plus years of the church, Christian dogma evolved away from its Jewish origins and came to regard Judaism as a mortal enemy and the Jews as the killers of Christ. During this initial period of changing dogma, Christianity did not pose an existential threat to Jewish life in Israel, and Christians represented but a small minority of the population in Palestine. That was beginning to change, that was to begin to change in the fourth century. In the year 325, Emperor Constantine granted Christianity legal status. Whether he personally ever converted or not is an unanswered question, but what is what is undeniable is the impact that his legalization of the Christian faith had on the history of Christianity, the Roman Empire, and especially the history of the Jewish people, both within and outside of Israel. With the legalization of Christianity, the status of Palestine suddenly changed, making it a prime focal point of Christian devotion and religious pilgrimage. Especially as Constantine and his mother Helena undertook a broad program of building churches and monasteries in Jerusalem and throughout Israel. The legalization and acceptance of the religion by the royal families, with the exception of Emperor Julia the Apostate, who ruled from 361 to 363, was a religious tipping point <clears throat> for much of the pagan population of Palestine. Over the decades that followed the adoption of Christianity as the state religion, the pagan population converted to Christianity. It was also a factor that led to increased anti-Jewish edicts and, restriction, and restrictions directed by the state and church against the Jewish population of the empire, but especially in Palestine. The rising religious persecution led to a minor revolt in Israel that lasted from 351 to 352, known as the Galus Revolt, named for the emperor, for the Eastern Empire, Caesar Constantinius Gallus. The revolt was centered in Sipari, but spread to Tiberias and Lud in the central part of Judea. The Romans put down the revolt, executed several thousand Jews, and raised Sipari to the ground. It should be noted that Sipari was soon rebuilt and be again became a Jewish center. Emperor Theodosius I, in response to the Gallus Rebellion, shut down the Sanhedrin in Tiberias in the year 358. Henceforward, the Sanhedrin had clandestine meetings until the abolition of the Patriarchate by Emperor Theodosius II in 429. The persecution of the Jews in Israel by the church and by the Roman state in the third, I'm sorry, in the fifth and sixth centuries gave an impetus to Jewish emigration, much of which was directed eastward toward Babel. Despite these negative factors, most of the Galio remained, retained its Jewish character until the Muslim conquest in the seventh century and the population of Israel in this last century appears to have been divided between the three religious communities, Jewish, Samaritan, and Christian. Interesting in this regard has been the unearthing during the past two decades of elaborate mosaics in the ruins of synagogues throughout the Galilee and Golan. <clears throat> Most recently, the 2022 excavations in Kukuk, a town in the Galilee north of Tiberias that was reported extensively by the Times of Israel. In releasing the most recent findings, UNC at Chapel Hill, the university running that dig, 
remarked on its website that, quote, these mosaics attest to the rich culture and the dynamism of the Jewish community, even in the late Roman and Byzantine periods. So much for the historians who attempt to write off the Jewish people as being in decline and who ignore the vibrancy of the Jewish community during the last years of Byzantine rule. That being said, although the Jewish population continued to cling to Israel and even to flourish after the abolishment of the patriarch in the fifth century and the church's suppression of the Sanhedrin, the preeminence of Israel as the physical center of the Jewish world and of Limu Torah was to wane and gradually shift it to Babel even before the Muslim conquest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, are there any questions that uh, people have uh, for Bob that uh, you want to ask at this point? Okay. Very extensive. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, putting up with me. <laughs> Thank you. Those Thank you. Those classy showed up for both. Thank you. The detail is remarkable. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I am glad you, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you, I hope you learned something. Don't <laughs> ask me to repeat it all. <laughs> Pardon? Don't if you want to, I, I believe the rabbi has put this on, uh, <laughs> um, on the full uh, YouTube. So uh, for those yeah. who uh, always do those those guys, uh, want to hear me again, uh, <laughs> it's available for them. Absolutely. Thank you, well, Bob. Th thank you so much, Bob. We, we, we all really appreciate Bob. this and sharing your, uh, uh, your extensive you knowledge on this topic. Thank you. Bob.